Hello, I'm Amanda Stratton and welcome back to the Fund Your Passion podcast with me and Mr. Passion, Mr. JBR himself, Darren Zellick. Hello, Darren. Hello, how are you today? I'm good, I'm good, and you good? How was your holiday? We missed you last oh, week. Well, yeah. we can talk about that later. My okay. holiday was good. Okay. When in Rome. Okay, when sounds in... good. But I am thrilled to say that for this episode, we have come down to Romans International and we are guests of you. Tom, thank you so much for having us. Thank you for having me on your podcast. We haven't had you yet. Well, you're having me on your <laughs> podcast, which is, I'm very grateful. Um, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to see the incredible premises as well. And for those people who don't know, who don't know about Romans International, just tell us what you do. Uh, so Romans International, I guess we are known as a supercar dealership, so we buy and sell supercars uh, as well as sort of luxury SUVs and other sort of high-end performance cars. Um, so we're a totally independent dealership, so we sell anything from Bugattis, obviously Ferraris and Porsches, anything down to a Tesla. Um, so yeah, so we are sales only and we operate just from this one site here. Have you been down here before? Have I been here before? <laughs> I almost make the coffee when I tell you. He's been down a few times. Just a few times. So I think, um, no, I've been working with Romans for over 20 years now. Yeah. So, you know, it's, Romans has been good to, to, to me throughout my career. And uh, I've always had the utmost respect for Tom and his dad, Paul, who, who built an in, incredible business. But one thing I do not know is where did the name Romans International come from? Or why, why did it call it Romans in Banstead of all places? Mm, yeah, interesting. Uh, so I think Romans, so Romans was officially founded in 1994 by my father, but it existed as a car dealership when he was a young boy. Um, and it went uh, into uh, liquidation, I think. And he always had looked in the window when he was a young boy and he wanted that name, Romans. And because we're got some Italian heritage, kind of went with that. Um, so yeah, he, he took on the name when he started his own, own business back then, um, yeah. Well, obviously you've, you've alluded to the fact that the business was initially started by your father. What inspired yes. you to get involved in it? Um, do you know what? I, I grew up not planning to come and work here, if I'm honest. I wanted to sort of go my own path a bit. Um, I knew Romans was always an option um, but I did kind of want to go down my own path. My mum didn't really want me to be a car dealer. Um, she wanted me to be a lawyer. But I actually had a passion for film and went into the film industry. And it just so happened that I was down here one day. I think I brought my Mini in to get cleaned or serviced or something. And I just got chatting to my uncle who was working here at the time. And he just wanted someone to come and help out a couple of days a week. So I just kind of came into it by chance, just literally just to help out a little bit. Um, and I just kind of fell in love with it, got a real taste for it. And when you're around these cars, it's, it's hard not to fall in love with it. It is a bit like that, the, mm. the motor industry, that if you dare step foot in it, mm. you can't get out because the, that drive and the passion and it's kind of this fueled adrenaline mm. just gets under your skin and the thrill of the chase of the deal is uh, like, nothing else I've mm. ever experienced. So did that happen like in a very short space of time, sort of you moving out of film and moving um, here or what was it, the progression did, like? Yeah, I mean, I was in between Was there film an epiphany? Jobs. There was, yeah, I guess when I was here, um, when I started here, I could see what I could bring to the table. Um, you know, we'd been through a bit of a bad period as a company. I think we'd just come out of the recession um, and there was a few you know, changes that were going on. So, so roughly what year was that? That was 2011 yeah, I came in. Okay. Um, and I just got a feel for things that I could do. I kind of fell naturally more into marketing. Um, so I was quite a visual person and quite analytical as well. And I could see our website could be a lot better. Social media was just starting. Um, so I got quite involved with that. Um, and I just kind of built a role for myself and just felt, yeah, this is, this is my calling. And did you always have a love of cars? I mean, you were driving a Mini and now you're surrounded by... Not yeah. that there's anything the matter with Minis. There's nothing wrong with Minis. No, I mean, I love Minis, but it's just a bit <laughs> well, different. We still have a Mini. I listen, I love yeah. Minis. I'm, I'm not dissing Minis. Just I did actually, for the record. I, I remember actually when I started working, I was like, I'll, I'll never change my Mini, but quite quickly. Yeah. Like, actually, I actually will. <laughs> but, um, I would. Definitely. Yeah. You can trade it in with you if you want. Yeah. If you fancy giving me... What kind me, of Mini have you got? It's a Mini Countryman. A, an old one? No, no. It, it's pretty 
massive compared to yeah. the. She was talking about this the other day, actually, when you put a you know an original mini next to the new mini country yeah. or something like that. It's it's ridiculous, actually. The, well, the size difference in yeah. size. Yeah. I've got a, yeah. a '69 Fiat 500 that I reckon you can actually park within the roof space of a modern Fiat 500. Uh, like I know we were, that, we were talking yeah. about that. We were talking about that Fit 500 or Bath we saw yeah. a few weeks ago. Yeah. That's right. Mm. So sorry, so, I yeah, digress. So I was I was into cars when I was a young kid, um, but I guess I went to boarding school from quite early on, so I wasn't actually around it as much as as you might think. Um, as much as my dad had a few cars parked in the driveway when I used to come back, but but yeah, I, I'd kind of gone down a different route, and I guess when you spend a lot of long journeys in the car of my dad, him on the phone, trading, dealing when I wanted to listen to music and I had to listen to him. Uh, it kind of made me just veer away from it a little bit, but yeah, I'm glad I sort of came back into it. And now, yeah, I, I, I love cars more now than I did when I was younger. For That's sure. lucky. It How is. did your mum feel now um, that you are officially a car <laughs> dealer? I mean, and she's glad that... Or does she still think you're doing film? No, no. <laughs> Although I do some, I kind of brought a little bit of the film in by doing some YouTube videos and stuff. So I've kind of not completely given up the film uh, stuff. But but yeah, look, she's 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 happy. I'm doing okay. She's yeah. happy. I'm doing okay. Of course, mums are proud. But look, I mean, we can't sort of hide away from the fact that in the last sort of decade, social media and and the various different platforms have brought a different type of accessibility to people who love supercars for dealers like yourself. So you mm -hmm. obviously, I mean, you're head of buying and marketing. Mm -hmm. How have you found that? Yeah, I remember when, so when I started, I think we had a Twitter page and a Facebook page with a couple of hundred followers. And, but I, I saw it as, a, as a, a great way to access new customers and, and sort of help build the brand digitally. And a lot of people at the time were like, you're wasting your time, don't bother with social media. We'll never sell a car from social media. And today we sell lots of cars from social media. Um, obviously, there's lots of platforms now, TikTok, Instagram, obviously, LinkedIn. There's, there's a lot to do, so it's, it's, it's quite a, a full-time job managing social media, but it's, it's become our best form of marketing. It's the best. I mean, we did a survey to our customers, and we got 90% of our customers follow us on one platform here, one, one or the other. Um, and it's the first sort of touch point with a lot of our customers. So not many people come down to the dealership as they used to, but they will see your Instagram post, they will see your Facebook post, and it's, the, it's just a great way to sort of inform people of your stock. So which is the, the platform that you must be on? Or are they all connect um, with different? Instagram is yeah. probably number one. Yeah. Um, that is because it's, you know, these cars are such a visual Simple, product yeah. and Instagram is a very visual platform. So Instagram is the best, but, you know, Facebook's handy. Lots of people on Facebook, um, LinkedIn. We've just started doing TikTok, which I know is a slightly younger crowd, but, you know, You can sell customers. cars to my kids, if yeah. you like. And they probably have an influence over what you drive. A lot of kids have influences yeah. over what their parents drive. Yeah. Maybe not you, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's handy. And, it's, and TikTok has a massive reach globally so you can really you know you can put out a post I think we put one post out on an AMG Black Series that four million people saw it so and that's when four we had million. like no followers oh yeah. wow you've got mm. a long way to go to get to four million I think <laughs> I get about five thousand if I'm lucky so obviously yeah, you've, had the, you've had the sort of film experience which I'm mm -hmm. guessing is did you do a, a degree or did you yes do a, yeah? I did a degree in, in film but that doesn't teach you how to work the algorithms because the algorithms on those social platforms are, are, are what make your posts fly. Mm -hmm. Your AMG, if you only had a handful of followers, you must have got something right. Do you know what it was that you... Uh, it's, it's not always easy to work out. Some things you put up that you wouldn't think do really well that do, and other things you think you've put loads of time and made it all look amazing and then it almost flops and doesn't get the, the engagement. But. Yeah, so like music's quite important, I think, especially for TikTok. So we chose for that Black Series a, a quote from, uh, no, a snippet from a Batman movie. And it was a very sort of Batmobile looking car and it just, it just worked. Um, so yeah, it's hard to find. You, you, if you put enough content out, you'll start to sort of realize the ones that work and ones that don't. And do different cars perform differently on social? So Yeah, definitely. Porsche always seems to do well. There's a lot of 
<laughs> Porsche nerds right, out there. Yeah. <laughs> of which um, I'm not one, just for the record. Okay. Um, so yeah, that does well. Ferraris obviously do well. Um, but yeah, there's, there's certain cars that you'd think would do really well, really obscure stuff that we think, wow, this is going to be, this is going to blow up, but it just, just doesn't, just, no. Um, but there's... And, and are people interested in seeing the million pound cars? The yeah. Ferraris, the Bugattis? Yeah, yeah the hypercars is the always... The hypercar stuff, everyone loves you, that Because it goes to a broader people, the people that maybe not into cars, but they'll see a LaFerrari or a Bugatti and think, oh my God, wow. Yeah, the um, dreamers. Yeah. yeah, the dreamers. Like so, me. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong with dreaming. I'm still aspirational. Yeah. One day. Listen, we're, One we're day. all plodding in the same direction. Yeah, we need to get the JBR press car. That's what we need. What are we going to get? Good I don't know. Please, can we... Chris was talking about a Porsche, but I think we need to yeah, do him off I'm that. Yeah, I'm sure he was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We might be able to find you something today. Exactly. What do you think I should get then? How many seats do you need? Uh, it needs to be able to <laughs> Depends if you have dogs or not. Depends, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, RS6. Yeah. Ooh. Can't really go Everyone too wrong with those. Amanda has dogs, I don't have dogs. So I'm okay. quite happy with a two-seater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One for me. And we've got, we've got a special Nagaro edition. So it's a little bit more than just yeah. the, the usual one. But An RS6? Mm. Can we see it when yeah. we have a little It's walk outside, on? I think. Is it? But it's, okay. a, it's a special blue. So here's a Let's question. Go. From a finance perspective, we've always seen, in terms of demographics, very different demographics of a Lamborghini buyer is to a Ferrari buyer mm -hmm. um, or a McLaren buyer. Is that kind of what you see when customers come to the showroom? You can, you can read and tell from their profile and their background what kind of car it is they're most likely to buy or going to be interested in? Um, sometimes, yeah. Lamborghini's probably got a slightly younger demographic than, than Ferrari. Um, and, you can, and you can tell they're more into the brand of Lamborghini. Um, so if, they're in, if, they, if they come dressed in lots of branded stuff, Louis Vuitton, stuff like that, that you know they're going to be more led by brand rather than you know, some of the Porsche guys that come in, you, uh, come in playing clothes you wouldn't know but they're just very they're just car guys they're very into the drive and but it's but it's yeah we, we never judge a book by its cover um we've had a we've had a guy turn up on a five gram moped um before dressed you know nothing that stands out and he ended up buying a, a million pound aston martin so wow. you just can't you can't always tell that's for sure do you get many women buying we get we do get quite a few actually um Obviously, we get the, a lot of people come in with their wives and the wives often make the decision or have a, have, a, have a big say in it. But we get quite a few car girl enthusiasts as well who literally just come in and buy a car for themselves, which, you know, is great. Curious, have you ever actually sold a car via social that somebody hasn't actually come in to see? It happens Regularly, very often. Does it? Yeah. We can literally put a teaser on our Instagram story of just a badge and we'll have potentially three or four people will call up just from that and we'll sell it the next day. It's not, sometimes that's all it takes. Wow. Mm. I was at a, um, a McLaren dealership a while back and inside I was standing looking outside and there were some young uh, people creating content sort of just jumping around and doing stuff around the cars mm -hmm. and the dealership was saying to me I know I was absolutely baffled by this and the dealership were like yeah this happens all the time you know kids come mm. and they're creating do you get that here because I mean you're, you're very public and it's a it's very yeah. you're very accessible we, we do get a lot of that most people ask um, we've kind of stopped we, we allow people to do what they want sort of outside within reason and take pictures and take videos we try and protect a little bit in the Inside. showroom um, Firstly, because they're a little bit closer together, the cars, and we don't want people sort of, you know, running around with big cameras. And also just to, if there's too much content about your dealership, I would like to keep some of it for ourselves. You yeah, know what I mean? yeah. So, yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's a phenomenon that I was just, I mean, it was, it was two girls and they were sort of doing some, you know, mm. I'm not quite sure whether mm. they were filming themselves or the cars. I think it was yeah. better yeah, both. sometimes you get the odd person sitting on a bonnet oh trying dear. to take a picture but you run out and yes we have a security team and, a, and lots of cameras but do you find that as you've been involved with cars and cars of significant value for well over a decade and been brought up with that that you 
become quite acclimatised to them and not blasé, but you, you kind of it's, you can get a it's bit just blasé. another car yeah. in your world. I mean, mm. and you know, where whereas in the normal world, it's you know, yeah, you get, when you've got you a, get girls wanting to jump over the bonnet and take photos mm. because it's but it's uh, it's exciting. a nice reminder sometimes when people come in and they're literally blown away yeah. to actually remember that these cars do that. They have yeah. that effect on people because you can get a bit blasé when you've got a, a Ferrari Enzo sat outside your office for. A month and you walk past it 10 times a day you do get a bit like oh it's just it's just an end <laughs> but then you remind yourself the value and the history and you know it, it's it sometimes just takes you a little yeah little bit of, kind of yeah bringing you back down i seem yeah. to remember back in the through the decade of the 2000s and maybe a little bit beyond i don't think there was a time i ever came to romans and there wasn't an Enzo. You had a, mm. a very special Enzo which had zero miles on it. Always. Yes. So my dad. Had so your dad sat on for a very yeah, not literally sat on it, like, <laughs> but he sat yeah. on that for a long time. And he yeah, kept he... saying to me, I, I kept saying to him, Paul, why are you ever going to sell this car? Mm. And he says, Why would I sell it? Is only going to go? I think in those days it's going to go over a million. I mm. think I remember he said, in this price was four nine five yeah. when they when they were launched. Yeah. And, they were selling around 600,000, 600 for a long time. He said, this is going to be over a million pounds. Uh, why would I sell it now? Mm. And, um, and of course, they're now around 2.4-ish million. Yeah, for now. a delivery mileage car, yeah. probably, get probably close to three. Close to three. Um, so if he'd hung on to it, he did eventually sell it. But So he was right in, in his yeah. philosophy. I, just I mean, they're only sell really going to ever go one way, I think. But yeah. but yeah, but we like to think of ourselves more as traders rather than collectors because yeah. you know cash flow is of very important and then as you well. presumably got quite a lot of cash tied up in your yeah, stock we do well, so I mean, presumably yes <laughs> i'm just looking around yeah. yeah yeah so obviously trying to move things i mean cars are selling very quickly over the last couple of years especially um you know cars don't tend to hang around very often um, so what's the stock what, things now do you think? what the average the average it varies, I guess. The higher end stuff sometimes takes a bit longer. Um, I reckon our average is probably about a month, but especially over the last couple of years, we've had so many cars that sell within yeah. literally a few days. Did you see lockdown changing, changing things at all? It definitely, yeah, it definitely changed things in terms of we didn't do any business for a couple of months. And then when everyone was out of lockdown, everyone wanted to spend their money because they couldn't go on holiday. A lot of people couldn't go to restaurants and people wanted something fun. So there was a huge surge in, in people buying at that point. But then more so last year was the, was the shortage of new cars mm. and all the supply issues, which has, again has massively helped because everyone's been buying secondhand and not being able to buy a brand new car. So that's, you know, ooh, that's where values have been going up and, and it's, been, it's been good for business. Now, good for business. You, if I'm right, originally were based in, on the site next door, yes. and this was another car dealership. This was a Ford dealership, yeah. I wasn't going to... It was a Ford dealership, yeah. <laughs> it was. You then bought this and, and have made this beautiful, and you're now doing next door as well. Yes. So, yeah, so we took this over from Ford. Ford, during lockdown, basically didn't come back and then put it up for sale, and then we've, we've redone it, um, kept a lot of the structure, but just completely you know, gutted it out. And then when this one was done, the old showroom where we used to work from looked a little bit sore um, and we wanted to make them look a little bit more in sync. So we've, we've started doing that one. Um, that should be ready in a couple of months and then hopefully we're done with building. So, um, <laughs> so what's the plan for the two? two? Is it just going to be just two showrooms or are you gonna Yeah, it's going to be two showrooms. We, we originally them? had an idea of doing that one just electric uh, and calling it Roma's Electric, but I think realistically there's going to be more and more electric cars anyway um, so we're just going to have probably hypercars over there more kind of supercars over here um, but yeah it's going to be a little bit difficult to manage two different sites um, but yeah. so electric <laughs> oh no we had a conversation we did to this. but that is a great um, topic to talk about because is it a great topic to talk about well, I, I'm a bit of a dinosaur, yeah. so I'm, 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 you know, slowly moving myself in, into the transformation into hybrid and, and fully electric, which unfortunately we cannot avoid. Um, have you seen a shift in the narrative coming from customers in thinking about this, or are they just buying up everything possible because it's the last hurrah and chance to buy 
naturally aspirated you know combustion engines or etc or, or yeah that, that, or that that's they're embracing the change now I, I, you know, there's there's an element of embracing the change but there's also been a shift in terms of yeah the realization that they're not going to make the, a lot of these cars anymore and there's we think they're going to become more desirable they're certainly going to become more collectible um so yeah there's been people buying up stuff with a long-term view but a lot of these people also have an electric car in the garage um you know a lot of people i think are going to have their daily cars certainly if they live in cities are going to be electric or hybrid of some sort and then they'll have their more collectible more investment cars um as well so i think they can all work together in someone's garage um and yeah i think it's the, the trend is daily cars cars that you're going to use a lot i think will eventually be more electric and are you sure. seeing that more amongst younger buyers or is that um i think across the spectrum i think it's across the board um yeah it's, it's become trendy i think to, to be driving something yeah. that's a little bit environmentally friendly um <laughs> it's easing your conscience <laughs> yeah yeah your carbon footprint is slightly offset um but yeah, across the board, I, I, I don't, we, we've got lots of young customers as well who, who just want the loudest and the, you know, big petrol engines. It's not like they're just, they're just the ones that want electric. So it's, it's, well, they it's want to across. be heard and seen. Yeah. That's the other thing, yeah. And, you know, with electric, you don't get heard right. and barely seen. So it's, it's, mm. it, is, it is changing and that kind of, my own experiences are, it's just a different experience, um, but one and have to get used to but it, it is finding its way to our feet exactly i mean you've i mean just looking around in here you've got some incredible cars and really sort of quite eclectic um a good mm. a, a good mix but you've sold some incredibly rare and incredibly valuable cars are there any that really stand out that either they were just super special or super expensive or yeah i mean there's quite a few that probably stand out um there's one in here which I'll show you in a minute, a Bugatti Veyron Grand Sport Vitesse. That one for me, I sold the car about five years ago and it's just the spec of it is insane. I always remembered it very well and we've just taken it back into stock. Um, we, one also the same model, funnily enough, really stands out because me and my dad went to Hong Kong uh, to buy it um, and it was in, it was full, fully exposed carbon fibre but it had Tiffany the, the, the customer that ordered it from Bugatti had specified Tiffany green accents all over it. Um, and he also had, which was very memorable, a, a plaque with his son's feet um, <laughs> in the car, like a, a, a sort of engraving with, the, with his footprints, um, which always kind of stood out. It was a bit bizarre, but... It's a bit niche, that. It's very niche. I mean, presumably whoever's buying a car like that... <laughs> Well, this is the thing. I assume <laughs> when we it's sold this, this is the way. This is the way it's it's, it's going or has gone. Uh, certainly in the last decade, with very wealthy people, they want something that spoke bespoke yeah. and individual to them. I've and got they do... mugs with my children's feet on it. Would you like <laughs> me to give you one of those? No, but that's the problem. Is they want something that's original, bespoke to them. That's you know, mm. it's unique. But the problem is when you come to sell it, it no one, you know, quite want that to, level you, you have to unravel someone else's feet in your no, car. Yeah, I've seen headrests. But there's an argument to say, but that's how it originally came out. And but do you remember when um, the Beckhams had their Bentleys with their monogram embossed oh, really? into the head? And, and there was actually quite a lot of pushback on that. There is in, in, in the footballer market, you see the similar kind of thing. Yeah, you see seen it in football. Several cars come for sale, and it's uh, how much is it going to cost to re, re, mm. reupholster all the. I mean, that must affect value. That must affect the way you finance the car. Uh, or not, because it's just something you can. Depends on what the actual car is, but yeah, I mean, I, th I don't think it, when, by the time we're financing, that's already been unraveled. A certain amount of money needs to be spent on the car to bring it back yeah. to, to, to its originality and, and sometimes some of the conversion kits that go onto cars as well won't mention any brands because we don't want to upset anybody but there are conversion uh, uh, like any of those converters that do a fantastic job and some that are less desirable and uh, certainly on a Porsche you couldn't sell a Porsche to a Porsche main dealer without returning it back to, to its original, original spec. Uh, uh, how, how it was so you've got to make sure you hold on mm. to all the bits that's come off if you want to sell the car in the future. Um, and, you know, but it's that desire to have something that's 
unique and bespoke mm. to the individual. So there's unique and bespoke, but let's say you know you put a new exhaust on or uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. Does that make it more desirable when you're taking we, it in? We're or? a bit like the main dealers in that respect. Mm. We prefer things to be original. To original. Yeah. Um, an exhaust, we'd probably get away with it because it does enhance the sound. But there's always risks with warranties being voided. So. Yeah, if we, if we try and get all our cars to be exactly how they came out of, came out of the factory. Um, other things like overfinish and urban, that's a little bit more acceptable. Um, oh, but that's more. names there. Oh, <laughs> <I was avoiding. laughs> no, I, I, I do like agree. I do, on those yeah. names, I do mm. completely agree with you, that actually. Mm. Um, but is it not like in, uh, you know, in a car dealer world that when you're selling a car, it's a unique feature that adds value. And when you're buying it, it's like, no, it's not worth mm. it because mm. we're taking it off. Yeah, we'd rather take it off. As yeah. much as people spend a lot of money doing it. So what happened to the Tiffany accents? Well, that just stayed exactly how it was. Because that, that is how it, it came. came out of the factory. Yeah. So and what about the feet? It stayed. Did it? It stayed, yeah. Do you know where the car is now? I do. And I the do. feet are still there? The feet are still in there. Yeah. I th I what's, think the what's the most bizarre is, uh, thing you've seen done to a car? That's, I mean, definitely that, up there. That, that's up there um, but yeah, no, I've seen, I don't know. It's, it's more people like putting their names in often, which I, I don't know, it's yeah. not something I would do, but. Um, I've seen some really strange wraps on cars mm. where you just think, why, why have you done yeah. that? Yeah. A wrap is, but, is know, temporary. Yeah, but at least you can remove yeah. it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there are some, some strange wraps. I've seen people with grass wraps, yeah. people with diamond wraps. There's, there's all sorts of, you know, yeah. some people are into it. Okay, so apart from that, with the strange feet and Tiffany blue, are there any other sort of really big cars that stand out that have passed through? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've had some true sort of unicorns here um, over the years. And yeah, cars that you just never, ever see. So we've had... Uh, McLaren F1 we've sold, we've had a, a Porsche GT1, absolutely crazy, crazy car and just mind-blowing values now. Um, the Maserati MC12, um, we've had I think two or three of them in a short space of time. I remember I had two of them sat in the showroom at the same time, there's only 50 ever made. Um, so that was pretty crazy. Um, and then possibly the rarest of all is the CLK GTR which is basically a, a race car, um, but road, road legal. And that, that thing is just, was the nuts. And that was road legal car. Did that stay in the UK? No, that car is now in Bahrain. Um, and we did a tour actually, this one customer bought the McLaren F1, the Porsche GT1, um, the MC12, and the CLK GT1 has got them all still there in Bahrain, which just, it's one of the most incredible collections you'll ever see. Gosh, that's like a field of unicorns. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew so many unicorns existed? <laughs> <laughs> that is you know, an interesting question come on from that is, um, you know, we see supercars and, and hypercars here, but we don't really see any truly race cars, which have become quite collectible mm. uh, these days. Is, is that something that interests? Uh, yeah, I guess. Are you going to stay true to, to what you've always Yeah, we, we kind of want to be, it's very easy to get sort of a bit muddled with what your brand is, I think. And it's very, you know, we'd love in some ways to get more into classics, but Rome's is known for having sort of the latest and the rarest stuff. Um, you know, there's neither me or my dad are hugely passionate about motorsport. Um, so maybe that has come into it and we just look to buy cars that people can drive on the road. So um, yeah, no, certainly wouldn't rule it out. And I think, you know, obviously race cars have amazing pedigree and it's hugely valuable and I'm sure there's money to be made, but yeah, we kind of want to stick and be known for sort of one thing, yeah. So obviously you, you mentioned earlier on about the fact that, that so many cars have not been coming to market because of mm -hmm. problems with manufacturing and whatever, but we've got a lot coming through. Are there things that you're looking forward to seeing and making their way into your showroom? Anything particular that stands out? Um, I guess the car I've personally got my eye on for, for, for stock uh, will be the GT4 RS Cayman. I think that's going to be a mega, mega car. Um, and we're known <laughs> for, for having... <laughs> Sorry, I should not to it's pick fine. the Porsche. It's fine. I just think I'm missing out on something. I think somebody one day mm. needs to sit me down and explain what I'm missing. 
Okay, yeah, I mean, but that's take, fine. Take a, that's because fine. they're too good and too perfect. Isn't it? It's because they're too good and too perfect. I just find them just yeah. too... Mm. Clinical or... So, clinical, clinical, yes. Yeah. 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 Some of the range is, but a, like a GT4, which you can buy for 100 grand, a manual GT4, that's, that's a great car to drive. It's a great car to drive, mm. but it's to, almost too perfect. It's almost mm -hmm. too good. That's my thing. Yeah. I just like it to be just a little bit, of, a bit, a bit more challenging, a bit more challenging, yeah. a bit more. Such as putting you on the spot. I don't know. That's a good question. Okay, now I'm on the spot. Something equivalent, hundred grand, not so perfect, great fun to drive. Um, it's going to challenge you. I'd say some McLarens. Yeah. Some McLarens. I've had a lot of fun with them. Um, I don't know. So McLarens it, are quite easy to drive. I yeah, think, but, but I mean, I've, I suppose I've had them on track, but they're easy mm. to drive as well. Yeah. Well. I mean, Unless you get a Carrera GT, yeah. they're not easy to drive. No. So. See, I, 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 maybe I'm just too, I, I hark back into the older stuff, but, yeah. but you're right. Now you've put the budget on it, it's, I'm, I'm struggling. Now, Carrera so. GT, that's a good car to talk about because that's got a bright future and stagnated in price for a long time, but they're kind of getting to the million now. Uh, they which everyone's been talking about for five years, it's going to get to a million, but yeah, I think it's almost there, isn't it? a million it? pound car, and it's, yeah. it's suddenly, there's, you know, there's this big shift in the market moments with the electric coming up and the ban of petrol cars. There has been a big shift to the more analog cars, F40s, F50s, yeah. Carrera GTs. Now you're talking. Um, and yeah, they, a lot of those cars have shot up in value in a short space of time. But what is it that drives that? Because for five years, everyone goes, Carrera GT, that's a million mm. pound car. And I was like, well, okay, but what's, what's going to drive it's, it then? Yeah, it's, a, pardon the pun, I mean, a lot of it comes with momentum, I find. Um, when one or two sell, and there's, there's a general feeling in the air, I think, of, you know, what's, what's long term going to be a great investment. Um, and also what a great, you know, what are the great cars? What are the all time best mm. cars out there? So, and with lockdown and other things happening in the world, I think more people have decided to splash their money rather than have it sat in an, a savings account. Um, and, you know, life potentially is <laughs> short. So, you know, and I think that's enjoy true it. to say in the Holy Trinity cars, the LaFerrari, the 918, and the P1, they, they, um, they depreciated. Mm. Uh, quite significantly, mm -hmm. and uh, now they're, they're rising back they're up. They're rising back up, yeah. So that's been helped by this, those other cars surging in value, actually has started to make them look good value. Even so, yeah. you know, if, if an F50 is three million, if an Enzo is two and a half million, a LaFerrari, which is newer, more advanced, um, you know, suddenly looked good value at two million. So they're, they're moving back upwards as well. Yeah. Mm. How long do you generally see people hanging on to their cars for? It really varies because some people have a long term view um, and they will, they're building collections, they put cars away, they don't drive them and they're thinking 10, mm. 15, 20 years. Other people, we've got lots of customers who literally change within a couple of months. They just love going through, they're just almost obsessed, obsessed with yeah. cars, obsessed with buying cars and they'll just keep changing and yeah, one they get bored like, easily. One, one thing we mm. talk about a lot is, isn't it a shame how many cars just actually don't get used, yeah. don't get seen, yeah. don't get used. It is a shame, but I kind of, you know, we've got a lot of customers like that and I kind of, I totally get it. I understand there's an, an enjoyment out of just buying and owning and sort of preserving something. I know, you know, a lot of our social media followers get very annoyed when we post the delivery mileage cars. They're like, how could someone mm. not drive this car? But I get the, the kind of why someone wouldn't, not just to make money, but it's just kind of, you know, not everyone's, you know, has to drive it. They just like having it, putting it away, preserving it, giving it a little polish. So one of the things that we're now looking at is we're asking you, yes. race, drive, collect. Now race doesn't have to be race. Mm -hmm. Race can be event. It can be, it, so I'm mm -hmm. broadening the race out so yeah. you don't have to take it specifically on track. So if you were standing with a gigantic checkbook where money was mm -hmm. no object, what are the three cars that you would choose? Well, so one to race, um, that would probably be, I don't know, I like the, the stuff that's the latest stuff. So I, I drive an AMG GTR at the moment, but the ultimate version of that is the GTR Black Series. That's also, I think, it's the fastest car around the Nürburgring, so it's got some kudos. And I think it just looks amazing. And it was it did very the well green on one, TikTok. wasn't it? 
<laughs> no, it's, uh, it's, it's black. The GTR... No, the one that did the yeah. Nürburgring. Uh, was it green? Wasn't it, it the Beast been. of Green Hell? Or they had some that very... Was the normal GTR. Was it? Oh, okay. I just JBR remember. needs to get onto TikTok. I think this is, where, this is, the, you need this to is my dance. learning. <laughs> oh, I can't dance. We'll have to get some younger people in to do that. I can't do that. Yeah, no it chance. is a younger, younger audience. But okay, so, um, it would so be the Black Series, the black. I think that would be the car if you could put anything outside today and say, take it around a track, I'd, I'd jump, jump in that. Okay. Um, what was the other one? Collect. Drive. Drive. Drive daily. I drive daily. Um, so much to choose from. There's a lot to choose from. I'm, I'm a big AMG guy. Um, I normally have a C63. I know it's you know, nothing special, but for me, that always just ticked all the right boxes. I think as a daily driver, it's good to have something, a little bit of wolf in sheep's clothing. You practical. don't want to be flashy every yeah. day. Um, and it's practical. It's got four seats, it's got a yeah. big boot, yeah. and it's got a good noise, and everything just works. Yeah. It's got a good tech, good sound system. So for me, that's, that's my favorite daily driver. Um, and then to collect... quite stiff. Uh, stiff I mean, what in, well, just bum bumpy when you're driving. Yeah, out. yeah, they are. They but are. But too, I, I more so that. that it makes it a comfortable drive. Or it's comfortable enough for me. I know if you if you step out of a Range Rover and jump in a it's C63, a it's, it's, it's not nice. But you know, I came from a Mini Cooper, which was all like a little okay. go kart. So C63 was. So you went from your Mini to a C63. Pretty much, yeah. Okay, Pretty that's much. a bit of. A but I've had lots of C63s, so. Oh. Oh. I kind of come in and out of them and you know i get quite a good choice around yeah. here but um but i often just go back to a c63 it just does does the job for me okay and then collect what would be the car that you lock away collect so one that we'd probably already discussed it would be the f50 um firstly because of rarity i know an f40 is more generally loved but an f50 is way rarer and it was it was my wedding car as well so i've got a bit of a soft spot for it um and i think it has if you could only have one car to collect, I think it has to be a Ferrari. So F50 would be for me. It's your wedding car. I mean, mm. That's quite cool. That is very mm. cool. Bright yellow. <laughs> we had like this um, gray, very old Rolls Royce. I got married Did in you? Gibraltar, okay. my wife's from Gibraltar, yeah. yeah. It was, I think, the only Rolls Royce in um, Gibraltar. We had to beg the guy mm. to let us borrow it. Huh. Yeah, yeah Rolls Royce cool. is, is, yeah. is a good wedding car, but yeah, F50. So did you, did you left very quick. Yeah, and I remember we yeah we got in it and we just drove off. And we How didn't did it work know with we dresses? Because that's a bit awkward. Uh, or not? I mean, I'm. I can't quite. I wasn't really focusing on that, but uh, I think it was all right. Okay. Yeah. Well, she that's awesome presumably she left with you, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You managed. But it, and the hair was a bigger issue because it's convertible. So, I remember her just being like. Any any arguments about that, or was no, it all very good natured? I think it, was fine. it was a good day. Good. Oh well, mm. that's great. Um, do you have any cars that you have in a personal collection? Not me personally. No. We we like to think ourselves as traders rather than yeah. collectors. Um, and yeah, I just have my one car. My wife has a car. Um, I probably should look to put something away, but. I don't know, it's hard to convince others, people would be like, no, we can sell that now. And be like, no, no, I'll have it and I'll put it away. But Is there anything that's come through that you look at and you think, oh, that kind of hurts selling often, that actually? Oh, often. really? Especially, especially when the market moves and you think, oh, if only I'd just kept hold of that one. Um, oh, the if only. Put it away, oh, but yeah, the if only, mm. there's many of them. So, okay, in here, right now, if we, the building was on fire, which car would we grab the keys for before we ran? It would have to be the Bugatti, yeah. which is over there, over there. the okay. Grand Sport Vitesse. Um, firstly, because it's the most valuable car in here. That's uh, a good enough reason. That's a pretty good reason. Um, but also, it's just, yeah, it's a bonkers spec and it's just an amazing car. We've got a nice SF90 mm -hmm. over there, which is, I find the whole project quite interesting because it's, you know, it's a half a million pound car, more or less. Yeah, it's very expensive. Uh, but it's a production car, so it's in yeah. theory no limit. You know, is that a car that's going to hold? It? You can't even put a bag in it. There's no room for a bag. Yeah, you can't even go anywhere with it. It's a, it's a pure driver's mm. car. Well, most of many of these you can. Unless you put a roof really rack on, I don't think you can actually put a roof rack. Yeah, on. it's it's the SF90 is an interesting one. It's yeah, it's a lot of money. I think they've stopped taking orders for the coupe. So right. as much as it's you know a production model, you can't. I believe you can't order one anymore. Um, but the people we've sold them to have all said it's a mind-blowing car. When yeah. I have driven one, it is unbelievably fast. Um, I like the way they look, personally. But I think it's a beautiful looking Yeah, car. it's beautiful. Yeah. And yeah, the people that have, have bought them love them, but there's a, 
yeah, they, they haven't held their money particularly mm -hmm. well so far. Um, but they will find their level. I reckon around 400, they start to look, you know, and, and they've got hypercar performance. So, you know, when you start comparing it to performance wise, it's, it's actually great value. But, mm. you know, maybe the, the, the spider might be the one to have, I think. It's quite, it looks good in the spider. We'll take two. <laughs> <laughs> Get me Listen, the final quote. Thank you so much. Um, it's Pleasure. been absolutely enlightening to talk to you, and um, you make great coffee as well. Ah, it's just a quick button, that's all it does. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I hope you've enjoyed this, and we will see you next time. Bye.